terms of the church fathers, there are three things that we want to discuss. First is how many quotations are by the church fathers of the New Testament. Secondly, what the value of the patristic writings are for recovering the text of the New Testament. And third are the problems of using the fathers to access that text and get back to the uh, original wording. In terms of the number of quotations, uh, it has been calculated that, in fact tabulated, that there are over one million quotations by the Church Fathers of the New Testament. Now, the Church Fathers span a period from the late first century all the way typically through the 13th century. And to have over a million quotations of a text that is less than 8,000 verses is absolutely astounding. Uh, some of these verses get quoted many, many times. Others get quoted just a handful of times. But the Holy Testament is duplicated more than once in these uh, church fathers and their writings. Now, in terms of the value of the fathers, there's really three things in which they are especially valuable. The first value of the church fathers is that they actually pinpoint for us the use of the text in a particular location at a particular time. We know about the church fathers who lived in Antioch of Syria or who may have lived in Caesarea Maritima or uh, Alexandria, Egypt. And so these fathers are using the text. We know uh, the dates of the fathers and we know the places of the fathers when they're using these texts. That helps us to locate a particular reading in a place and time when we don't have sufficient evidence from the Greek manuscripts, especially through the first three or four centuries where uh, the, the manuscripts are not as uh, frequent as what we get in later centuries. So the fathers help us to pinpoint the text in uh, uh, space and time. A uh, second value is that what this also helps us to do is to understand what's known as text types. Most textual critics today would say that the New Testament manuscripts are organized into three or four categories known as text types. These are broad families in which the manuscripts are copied, uh, whether it's by an official recension or just by the natural growth of the text in a particular region. And so you have uh, the Alexandrian text type, which uh, grew up in and around Alexandria, Egypt. You have the Byzantine text type, which grew uh, up and around in uh, Constantinople, and to some degree, uh, perhaps uh, Caesarea Maritima. And you also have the uh, Western text type, which started in the East, but ended up going to the West and became really the text of Rome and its environs. So the fathers help us to fix the text types that we have in a particular locale as well. And this was some work that a fellow by the name of uh, B.H. Streeter did in the 1920s to locate the text types by using the church fathers and help us to understand better the nature of these various regional originals that were copied by hand for centuries in each locale, for example. A third value of the church fathers is that there are times when these patristic writers actually discuss textual variants. And when that happens, they are worth their weight in gold. They will talk about, here's a text that has this reading, but this manuscript has this reading. Now, they won't necessarily specify the manuscripts, but they'll say things like, uh, well, for example, Eusebius talks about the longer ending of Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. And he says, most of the manuscripts that I know about don't have these 12 verses. And, of course, he didn't say 12 verses because verse numbers were not added to the Greek New Testament until the year 1551. But he talked about that ending. He said most of the Greek manuscripts, or most of the manuscripts he knew about, did not have those verses. And then later, Jerome adds to this most of the Greek manuscripts that he looked at did not have those. This may imply that now, by Jerome's day, that ending, those 12 verses, had been found in other versions, in particular Latin, which was the language that he was most acquainted with. So these church fathers talk to us about uh, the particular variants as they occurred and what their frequency is in various centuries. We read in later centuries that another church father is quoting from uh, Mark 16, and this becomes the standard text, and he says this is what is found in most of his manuscripts. So there are some people who like to uh, count our text of the New Testament or uh, do textual criticism by counting manuscripts. But the problem with that is when do you count and what do you count? If you're counting in the 20th century and looking at all the manuscripts that are still in existence, 
then we can have the majority of manuscripts that have a particular reading. But if you go back in earlier centuries and you ask this church father, who may have had access to a great number of manuscripts, what he knows about, and he'll say the vast majority of the manuscripts that I know about have this wording, but not that wording. And consequently, when they discuss these textual variants, and when they talk about the frequency of a particular reading that occurs in the manuscripts that they are aware of, especially if they are a patristic writer who has access to a number of different uh, resources, that becomes extremely valuable for doing textual criticism. In terms of the problems that the fathers pose for us in trying to get back to the autographic text of the New Testament, there are essentially four uh, difficulties that they, uh, they create. Uh, first of all, we don't have the actual original manuscripts of these church fathers. What we have are copies of them that are, generally speaking, of medieval origin. And consequently, we have to do textual criticism on these extant or now existing manuscripts to try to get back to the original wording of what that father actually wrote. And when we do that, then we can try to reconstruct the Greek text or the New Testament text that he's actually using. So the first problem then is we don't have the church father's originals. We have copies of them that we have to use to get back to what that church father actually said when he's quoting from the New Testament. The second problem in the use of the fathers is whether they are actually quoting from the New Testament or whether they are just alluding to it. For example, uh, we have uh, an early church father in the second century who talks about the story of the rich young ruler. Now, everyone who reads the Gospels knows about this story, and yet he is never called the rich young ruler in any one of the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the story, but he's not called the rich young ruler in any one of those. And so if a church father is saying the story of the rich young ruler, well, which form is he talking about? Matthew's form, Mark's form, or Luke's form? And uh, is he alluding to the text or is he quoting from it? In Philippians 4.13, for example, Paul says, I can do all things through the one who strengthens me. But an early church father alludes to that reference, or maybe he's quoting from the text, and he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, the addition of Christ is found in some later manuscripts. Is this church father... Uh, following that text form, even though he predates those manuscripts? Or is he just interpreting this text or just alluding to it? And for him, the one who strengthens him is in fact Christ. Those are some of the difficulties we have. Are they quoting directly from the text or are they alluding to the text? A third problem with the church fathers has to do with the source that they're actually quoting. And this especially is a difficulty when it comes to them quoting from the uh, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When they say, as our Lord said, and then they quote what Jesus said, is the form of it what comes out of Matthew or Mark or Luke? And the problem is that we'll have manuscripts that will give it as the form of what the Lord said in Matthew, or other manuscripts that give that as the form of what Jesus said in Mark's gospel. And so is he quoting from this group of manuscripts in Mark or this group in Matthew? If he doesn't say as is written in Matthew or as is written in Mark, then we have some difficulties in trying to determine exactly what he is quoting from. The final problem with the use of the church fathers is that there are times when a particular father is going to quote from the New Testament uh, from the same passage more than once and the difficulty comes when he quotes it in different forms. Sometimes he may quote from it three or four times. Each time is a little bit different. So which text did he follow? Was he being sloppy in his quotations? Did he use a different manuscript each time? Or is he just alluding to the text? Is it from memory? Or is it from copying out a manuscript in front of him? Those are complex issues that are not exactly easy to resolve. However, the lengthier the passage that the father quotes from, the more likely it is that he is copying out the text that is in front of him, and consequently we have a greater degree of certainty that he is actually quoting from that text of the New Testament rather than doing so from memory or alluding to the passage. Well, to sum up, there are certain values to the Church Fathers that are extremely important, but there are also problems with the use of the Church Fathers. And on a sliding scale, scholars have come up with uh, a view that says Here's the way we can tell whether this church father is really quoting from this text or not. 
and there's levels of certainty that we can have about it. The fathers therefore become extremely important for the text of the New Testament for us to get into the window of what that original text must have looked like. But there are going to be difficulties along the way and sometimes it's just too difficult to use the quotations of a church father to establish much of anything about the wording of the original text.